You're listening to Green Rapids Podcast. Welcome. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) We're here with Carlos. From Wimiac. Yeah, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, My name is Carlos Calderon, uh, currently the Director of Sustainable Community Development at the West Michigan Environmental Action Council, or WEMIAC. That's a mouthful. It is. It is a mouthful. Thank you for acronyms. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> Although we all have, like, there's so many to know. <laughs> acronyms get me every time. Uh, but we're excited to have you here. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so today we're going to talk with Carlos about kind of like the urban water cycle and what, like, even just going through things like what is a watershed and like how does, how do our water habits impact our local environment and things like that. Yeah, and I'm excited to hear about this because I am going to be really honest and open saying, like, if somebody said watershed to me and asked me to explain it to them, I'd be like, ask Carlos. <laughs> I do not know what it is at all. So, so that said, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> what is a watershed? What is a watershed? <laughs> sure. Uh, I think the, the most straightforward answer to that is a drainage area. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's the area of land where all the precipitation throughout the year falls and mm-hmm. drains to a common point which is typically a stream river or lake mm-hmm. okay and or for the listeners who said screw science class what is precipitation <laughs> precipitation is all of the different forms of water that fall from the sky okay okay so it includes like the basics like rain snow hail oh yeah etc okay. everything that happens in michigan <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. All of we, the sky things. We've got it all. <laughs> we've got it all. So watershed is though specifically then what is shed from the skies mm-hmm. into natural source water sources. Sh- shed from the land. From the yeah. land. So yeah, from the, the land. water that comes off, off of, of that? the land okay. or through the land because yeah. there's groundwater interaction as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then ends up in a place like the Grand River. Okay. Nice. So can we get like a macro kind oh, of yeah. visual of what that looks the, like? The watershed concept is super cool to me because it's this nested, layered mm-hmm. concept. You have a huge watershed, mm-hmm. the ocean, or oh. oceans, mm-hmm. right? And then from there, you have little par- piece, pieces of the continents mm-hmm. that form all of the different landforms that they have mm-hmm. and then have these huge river systems like the Mississippi. Okay. Or the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And the Great Lakes can mm -hmm. be further divided into even smaller pieces of land. Mm -hmm. So there's all of the land, half of the land at the lower peninsula, parts of uh, Wisconsin drain into Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. You zoom in even further, we have the the Grand River watershed. So Mm -hmm. all of the area of West Michigan that Mm -hmm. the water in the Grand River comes from. Okay. Okay. And then even smaller, we have uh, tributaries like Plaster Creek, the Rogue Mm -hmm. River, and each of them even have sub watershed units. Um, Plaster Creek, of for course, interesting, right. I, I listed here uh, Silver Creek. Mm-hmm. Silver Creek is a really interesting stream because it's mostly buried. What? About 100 years ago, and this is very common throughout the country, throughout the world, really, mm-hmm. during urban development, especially in the 20th century, mm-hmm. one of our solutions was to put, a, put the stream into a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so why would we do that then it turns into a storm sewer okay so now all of the oh, all of sad. that inconvenient water that's on the land we funnel into these little streams mm-hmm. or underground culverts in the case of storm sewers yeah and then they end up in the larger water bodies but like who gets to determine mm. what's inconvenient to mm-hmm. people or yeah. not even people to land, to animals, to wildlife. Yeah, because wildlife obviously can exist underground in a pipe the same way it does as like a surface level, like stream or river, right? I- exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the most of Silver Creek that's underground, no fish live there. That's sad. no insects, no frogs, no turtles, and and no the birds. the well the water is not only filtered, uh, but then else. it's also impacted by like the corrosion of pipes and like external non-natural right like the just the non-natural world being mixed into the ground like that correct yeah Yeah. all of all of the storm sewer systems in the city of grand rapids for instance are untreated unfiltered okay so it goes directly from the surface into the pipe into the stream Okay. okay 
And I remember at some point hearing a lecture by Araceli when she was still with Plaster Creek Stewards about how, like, Plaster Creek absorbs a lot of, like, pollutants upstream and then it tends to deposit those downstream, which just so happens to be where there's frontline communities. Oh, yeah. So, like, stuff like that where, like, it's not filtered, it's not being processed. So, it's just, like, passing that harm on to another part of the system. Yep, exactly. Um, The the stormwater, and I kind of had this a little bit further into Mm -hmm. the... um, uh, conversation, but mm-hmm. s- uh, stormwater runoff, the surface runoff that's carried during a, a rain event, mm-hmm. um, takes whatever is on the land and brings it down into the storm sewers, or in, in, in this case, the water body like uh, mm-hmm. Plaster Creek. So, okay. Plaster Creek watershed, um, you know, it it has a gradient from rural to very dense urban. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so out in the Gaines Township, Caledonia area, we yeah. see a lot of agriculture, a lot mm-hmm. of suburban um, and, and rural developments popping up. Mm-hmm. Those uh, fields and those new communities that are being built are connected to the stream through mm-hmm. drains and other sewer uh, sewer systems. Yeah. And then, yeah, it just continues to build up as it gets further and further downstream, which is why Plaster Creek is notorious as one of the most polluted streams in Michigan. I mm. have heard tell, and that's kind of depressing. Yeah. The larger, I guess, like the the chemical life that we may or may not live is impacting the water? Sure. Um, I mean, the, yeah, like can, I said, this is a question and a statement. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm not really sure if this is correct at all. But So there's there's definitely kind of two, two main groups big groups of pollution there's chemical pollution and physical pollution okay right so chemical pollution um sometimes it's referred to by the regulators as point source pollution this is like industrial pipes Mm -hmm. that that empty right into a stream right most of that's regulated and illegal now right um, since the clean water act in in the 1970s Mm -hmm. um the the physical side, the, uh, one of those things that a lot of people don't think about is all of the debris, the fine sediment, the the mm-hmm. er, the erosion from you know the fields that are plowed extensively, yeah. uh, the road okay. salts, which are chemical but also um, cause physical, physical yeah. mm-hmm. issues within the stream for wildlife. Yeah. So there's a there's this huge suite, and that's mostly called non-point source pollution. Okay. Because it doesn't come from a single yeah. source it comes oh. from everywhere so most of, like the largest pollution f- toward the water streams would be things that just kind of run off the larger portions of our world like exactly. dirty roads mm-hmm. like exactly. um unsafe practices and disposal and stuff like that yeah mm-hmm. yep um so the the way that things like microplastics beauty products different types of nutrients or or pathogens like e coli those typically come from wastewater processes okay mm-hmm. so the wastewater treatment recovery facility does a really good job of getting out most pollution okay mm-hmm. most of the nutrients most of the bacteria and other pathogens mm-hmm. but they're in, in most regulation for clean water there is an allowable amount of pollution yeah to be discharged and is that measured kind of like PFAS with like parts per million yeah depending on yeah depending on the type of pollutant it could be parts per billion parts per trillion parts Mm -hmm. per million grams per liter or milligrams per liter yeah there's a there's a huge scale you know and it all just depends on what that particular um, type of pollution does to the environment Mm -hmm. okay and and so because our general waste goes through the tubes and filtration systems it's not nearly as much of an impact and issue as the other larger ones that you may have just mentioned Mm -hmm. yeah typically you know all of all of the modern wastewater treatment facilities are doing as good as our modern technology allows okay cool it's just good to know you know sometimes i wonder like how much of my impact impact is like really going down a sink or like Mm -hmm. just in general so thank you for explaining that i appreciate it Um, so if we could zoom out um sure i know that you said that there's like all these like levels within levels of those watersheds um so to touch on like our 
probably maybe our most significant local watershed. Can you talk about the Great Lakes Basin? Yeah, the Great Lakes Basin, um, of course, it's it's a very unique ecological system Mm -hmm. um, in the world. Uh, In a very relatively small space, we have over 20% of the world's surface fresh water. That's a lot. Are we greedy? We are a little, we're, we're water rich here, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, uh, anybody who's outside of Michigan, this is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> anybody looking for fresh water, well, turn away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, y- yeah, so. Crazy um, in California. <laughs> in, in, interestingly enough, um, some of my graduate research that I did included looking back at water policy through mm-hmm. the decades. Mm-hmm. Um, the United States has a very interesting perspective on water. Um, you know, see the current or the most recent Supreme Court ruling mm-hmm. on wetlands protections. Yeah. Uh, but that's a whole long history, and it would probably take an hour to explain everything. Next more episode. More. Uh, <laughs> um, but at least here in, in the Great Lakes region, there are eight United States um, that, that touch or are, are part of the basin and two mm-hmm. Canadian provinces. Um, so we have both an interstate compact mm-hmm. and an international charter oh. to protect the waters of mm-hmm. the Great Lakes. Okay. And of course, with any policy, there was compromise along the way. So mm-hmm. certain things are allowed to to happen to a degree. That um, should have happened? You know, probably. <laughs> <laughs> because you can't regulate so many different space or territories in one way yeah it might just not be practical or feasible Mm -hmm. to monitor you know every single gallon you know so instead we have to look at it from the million gallon perspective you know or trillion gallon perspective Mm -hmm. um so as far as moving water in and out of the great lakes basin for Mm -hmm. example helping out some of our um drought stricken you know, states yeah. out, out, or communities out west, mm-hmm. we, we would never be able to al- alleviate the drought with the Great Lakes water. Right. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I know a lot of people th- think about, like, can we use the Great Lakes to bring water out to the west? Yeah. No. Um, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there mm-hmm. were a lot of campaigns to do oh, that. Does somebody want, like, a Michigan to California pipeline or something? Yeah. <laughs> I believe there it. Was, and there was a whole very um, questionable um, ad campaign in yeah. in the Great Lakes region to stop that. Um, okay. Very critical and using a lot of derogatory terms for mm-hmm. folks out west. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Again, because we have all of these regulatory bodies and partnerships with um, states and the Canadian provinces, mm-hmm. um, we, we protect the Great Lakes as good as we can. Yeah. Okay. As we should. And I'm not saying no because I don't want people to have water. No. I just think like reallocation of resources from one state across the entire country so that again i'm gonna keep saying it i love avocados but so that we can have avocados and bananas whenever we want it's just like so impractical Mm -hmm. it's just it does not make enough sense to even start a campaign to do not with with at least first addressing the causes of all of the drought out there right you know they they've drained the aquifers they've dammed rivers Mm -hmm. they they withdraw it for agricultural purposes Mm -hmm. in in places where they wouldn't be able to grow food if they didn't drain the rivers and And the aquifers and that's because it's hot and it's sunny and and they know that that's what it takes in order to get food but it's not necessarily the climate it can grow in. exactly yeah. yeah and it's basically terraforming in a way that's not sustainable exactly mm-hmm. and okay. again see the colorado river it <laughs> it doesn't make its way all the way to the sea anymore <gasps> because of how much water we withdraw from it every year dang so just like peter's that at a point yep that's kind of dang where does it i guess start um starts up in in like the I think it's the western side of the Rocky Mountains, so it would drain through between the the Rockies and the Cascade Sierras okay. in California. Mm-hmm. And so it would make its way through uh, Arizona, Southern California, and then into Mexico. 
Mm. But it's starting to dry up before it even crosses the Mexican border. Mm -hmm. Um, There's still some water there. So some activities like agriculture happen on the Mexican side. But 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 years from now, they might not have access to Colorado River water. Mm. Mm. And, And then also the again the wildlife that yep. grows along that river that lives in that river yeah. that uses the river to get in and out of the ocean yep. those all are impacted which means like food chains get impacted and so on and, exactly and that kind of not only will push animals but then push us in other directions as well mm-hmm. yeah exactly yeah. and and that's one of the reasons kind of going back to the watershed concept that we're trying to think more in a watershed model rather than just stream river lake as right. separate mm-hmm. entities yeah because the land interface between the water is where the water comes from mostly mm-hmm. right okay, yeah. so the way that we the way that we manage our land impacts the the quantity and quality of the water yeah in oh, my geology preach. class. Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> my geology class, we talked about that as like the interaction between like the like geosphere, which is like what's made out of like rock and stone and soil, and like the hydrosphere, which is like all the water on the planet. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of cool how those are interconnected. We're, we're a water planet, right? I mean, we are a water you, planet. even in the desert, there's water. Yeah. But mm-hmm. some areas are drier than others, some mm-hmm. areas are wetter than others. Yeah. Well, compare it to your body. We're still a system. Oh, yeah. And we still need every single piece of it. We need to maintain it properly and preserve all that we can because it's so important to have every piece. I love I love the the mantra water is life Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. we we are water is another Mm -hmm. one that I like to say, Mm -hmm. too, because we are we're water. We're made up of water. The things we eat are made up of water the places that we love are typically associated with water. Mm -hmm. Um, Even in in cultures throughout the world, water is such an important piece. And even in um, desert cultures Mm -hmm. in the Middle East, North Africa, they have water features Mm -hmm. in their palaces. And it was a sign of affluence to be able to bring water from the desert Mm -hmm. into your courtyard or into your palace Mm -hmm. um, and say, like, this is... This is a really important thing for water. us. Yeah, check out this water. Mm-hmm. So it reminds me of Dune. With those <laughs> desert people with like yeah. the extreme water reclamation. You bring that up in this <laughs> room specifically more than anything, and I love it. Really? Yes, this is like the second or third time you've talked about this movie. Oh, I, I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> I need to read the book. Um, I'll watch the movie. <laughs> um, but so, so when you talk about then the Great Lakes watershed, you're talking about, like you said, preserving all of the land around the water that not only is around the Great Lakes, but then runs into the Great Lakes. Because if we protect that space, we allow for nature to do its thing properly. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So since we're talking about the watershed, I feel like it would also be good to just like just give like an overview about like the water cycle. Yeah. Yeah, water water cycle. It, Ooh, elementary. It's Let's one of yeah. You'd think right. You'd think it's an elementary concept. But also, I feel like they teach it once and then never again. So I but don't never again. For so yeah. yeah. So, so start people with need little. to people need to be thinking about it all the time. In mm-hmm. my opinion, mm-hmm. um, and it can start like you can think about it um, if if you're like a mindfulness practitioner or something along okay. those lines, mm-hmm. and you're talking about your breath. That's the start of your water cycle. Oh. Because every time we inhale and exhale, not only is oxygen and carbon dioxide exchanged, but water is also exchanged. Right. Mm. Because there's water, that, like. there's water all over, right? Water's in the air. It's not just in the ground or in the, in the mm-hmm. rivers and lakes or in mm-hmm. the clouds. Yeah. yeah. Water's everywhere. Mm-hmm. So water is uh, inhaled, exhaled. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, in my notes, I, I, I came up with the term um, plants are the contra lung. So I where we I like that. we inhale oxygen and mm-hmm. exhale carbon dioxide mm-hmm. through our lungs, right? Mm-hmm. They do the reverse. Yeah. So they take in the carbon dioxide and breathe out, or not really breathe, but they release mm-hmm. <laughs> oxygen. Yeah. Um, and again, during that process of photosynthesis, water is exchanged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they also give out water. Mm-hmm. Um, and in places uh, where there are rainforests, for instance, you can actually see water throughout the day if you like time lapse video. You can mm-hmm. see water going in and leaving plants. So they they do take these breaths 
They're just much longer breaths than what we have. Mm. Cool. So this this concept is yeah this this concept's called evapotranspiration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because plants take up water from the ground. So this is another break it down. Yeah. (laughs) Evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration. So and what is evaporation and transpiration, which is the exchange of water from the physical surface mm-hmm. so the, the leaves the pores in the leaves of the trees and other mm-hmm. plants mm-hmm. release water okay it just yeah. happens okay. unintentionally just like we release water we from perspirate. our perspirate yeah or we or we perspire <laughs> yeah that's a that's another form it's of the same thing that's part of the water cycle yeah mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. yeah oh. So once that, yeah. Okay. So now, so now the water is out in the atmosphere. It's out in, it's out in the air. Mm -hmm. And when it's warm, when warm air brings it up, rises up and into the atmosphere and condenses into clouds. Mm -hmm. So there's condensation in the clouds. Mm -hmm. Eventually, enough water collects, and the right pressure conditions happen, and then we have precipitation. Okay. Snow, rain, hail, all all sorts of things. Hurricanes, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, Really extreme weather events can happen because of this. Do you study clouds a lot as part of your work? I did not, unfortunately. No, I I didn't get a lot of the, um, I guess, physical um, environmental Mm -hmm. sciences through my... I'm a biologist, so Mm -hmm. my... um, Un- undergraduate degree is focused in ecology and evolution, and then my graduate degree is in watershed ecology. Nice. Okay. Go off. I was just curious because I'm like an unofficial member of the Cloud Appreciation Society, oh. and I figured that. Why did you look at me like that? Yeah. <laughs> so I was that's just awesome. wondering if that's as great. part no, of like the I, water cycle studies, if you can. Yeah. No. I. Too. You know. In retrospect, there are probably a hundred classes that I would have ta- would have loved to have taken, but mm-hmm. didn't. Meteorology, climatology, things yeah. like that would mm-hmm. have been really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, if, I guess if I had the foresight twenty years ago to say yeah, right. I should study climate stuff, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd I feel like we're sitting probably here talking about the not going to reverse climate change. Maybe I should jump <laughs> in on that. Like we were really all hoping. Yeah. No. Um, thank you for uh, being so. It, like so passionate about learning about these things. I'm also passionate about learning about these things. My brain just doesn't work the same way as you. I think you retain information in a way that is a little bit different. And then your ability to relay it is really helpful. Oh, mm-hmm. thank you. Um, I have an annoying um, habit of retaining information. Um, <laughs> I used to do a lot of trivia and, mm. and win a lot. Okay. <laughs> Noted. I Do know. not play trivia against Carlos. <laughs> not against. No. You'll you be the host. You can always join. You can always join my team. You I, can be I the enjoy host. Having teammates. Okay. I also enjoy having. Yeah. Like all right. Teammates. Okay. So we were like talking about sh- this. Sh- the yeah. system. <laughs> we were talking about systems. We're at. I think we're at precipitation. Yep. Right. So yes. all of the water and it, all of its liquid and solid forms comes down. Mm-hmm. Um, I had an and crazy things happen. Right. Like, did you like see what? the rain donut this mm-hmm. week? We were in the middle of a rain donut. It rained a little bit yesterday. Uh-huh. But if you look in a pa- if like you look at the satellite, it's just this ring oh. of rain of this rain system. Okay. It, it looks similar to but not anywhere near the scale of a hurricane almost. Okay. <gasps> Is was, this in Michigan or is this exciting. happening right Regional. now here in oh. the Great Lakes region? Oh, okay. So, so those donuts like kind of moving around? Yeah. Just meandering? Is it glazed? <laughs> I think sprinkled. Okay. Right. I love, oh my God, my favorite. That was my favorite. Don't you get it? Sprinkles? That was a water pun. <laughs> oh. No. Yeah. no, I'm literally like imagining sprinkled I like donuts. That. I thought of that. Wait. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, so, so we're in a rain donut, the, yeah, the rain donut. And I mean, this is, I think this is an anomaly. I don't, I don't know how often this happens. I've never heard of it being referred to as a, as rain, a rain donut, donut? before. We can ask okay. Um, so that maybe this is something new. Maybe we'll see it more often with climate change. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who knows? The future The fact that is... it's like a low power... A hurricane makes me slightly concerned because if that were to be exacerbated, yeah, it could potentially we could potentially be getting hurricanes up here. Do they happen in freshwater conditions? Not. Tip- I was gonna not ask. typically. No, the tsunamis can. The right. Um, 
I, I believe, and again, not being a climatologist or meteorologist, and uh-huh. not being an expert in weather systems, mm-hmm. but I believe the 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 intense low pressure is really what drives hurricane in its mm-hmm. wind plus rain. Okay. okay. And and I've recently heard some emergency uh, management folks talking about the storm surge as a really important mm-hmm. factor in hurricanes. Okay. We don't have that level of intensity of storms yeah okay. it would be an unprecedented like thousand plus year event but also um, we've been experiencing a lot of unprecedented yes events, like so. like donut don't, rain yeah i was gonna say <laughs> don't rule it out um <laughs> for, for future you know who knows Ex or ex president. I, so. I, <laughs> I, th- I mean, I and I know this sounds kind of crazy right now, all of us, but like I think th- the whole idea though is we're seeing things that we haven't really seen before that people don't really have a name or an explanation for, mm-hmm. and so there is the potential for things to shift as we see more flooding, as we see more droughts, as we see more extremes in weather patterns or just weather in general, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. I feel like we do see more hurricanes than I remember seeing in the past. Yeah. I don't know if that's a media coverage thing or if that's simply because they are on record happening more frequently, but that has to be connected to our climate changing if it's synonymous with oh, yeah. The, yeah. the timeline. You know, well, you know what I, I like to think of it as, you know, weather is a function of climate. So climate is, you know, the big thing. Mm-hmm. And then because of the different pockets and landforms and pressure mm-hmm. systems, different weather things things happen hurricanes mm-hmm. tornadoes monsoons um All and that's m- that's more likely for michigan mm-hmm. well into the future you know uh the year 2100 has been kind of the, the new benchmark for like extreme change okay um and m- monsoons that it's happen that you know further south mm-hmm. out west they might shift towards the Great Lakes. It's, mm. you know, it's still debatable or we, we don't really know uh, yeah. if we had a glass or a crystal ball, mm-hmm. um, we would know. But Who's got the ball? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what's going on. So <laughs> one thing that fortune tellers should be fortune telling. So is, and is that because precipitation will change depending on where the water is most concentrated? Well, yeah, it's, typically it's where the water is coming from okay. so a lot of in as particularly in west michigan we get a lot of our weather systems originating to the west okay so they they might be out, forming out in the plains but once they hit lake michigan things go all sorts of weird um sometimes it's a buffer sometimes it's an intensifier oh you know, we have things like lake effect snow mm-hmm. where you know the 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 plain states, you know, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, they get a lot of snow, mm-hmm. but a system that's dropping 10 inches over there hits Lake Michigan and might drop 20. Right. Um, so just this intensification, and that's because of the temperature difference between Lake Michigan and the air. Mm-hmm. There's evaporation happening, right? Yeah. Water's being put up into the air, gets mm-hmm. picked up by these weather systems and yeah. turned into snow. Um, and with with warming winters, it's proposed that or hypothesized that we'll have less ice cover in the winter, which will lead to more lake effect events oh, in the winter. Oh, interesting. Okay. But if temperatures are rising, they might not be solid precipitation like snow and ice. It could be more liquid precipitation. So we might be getting more rainfall during the winters than oh, snowfall soggy. well it kind of happened, happened last, last winter, winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. it is and and maybe nancy like i know you've noticed what, about 10 or so winters you've been uh, in michigan five, oh five I, why am i comparing that that was me i've been in Grand Rapids for 10 years um so five winters versus like we've seen well over 20 of them. And so Mm -hmm. I do notice things like that where we did have quite a bit of rain. So yeah, I guess that that's really an interesting way of looking at it. Like, because even like my first winter here was like January of 2015 before I actually moved out here. And like, yeah, it was just really snowy. It was like very winter wonderlandy, and I was like, I'm going to move to Michigan. (laughs) I'm just kidding. And now I'm like, Oh, it's soggy. So 
obviously climate change does has the have the ability to change the precipitation amount but it also can change the way that we get that yeah okay yep I was just, just very curious as we're talking about it. And that's mm-hmm. why those types of weather events might be more common to happen in Michigan. If we're potentially facing droughts in other places or facing flooding in other places, it'll just kind of like shift things in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What One of the um, models that I was looking at in, in preparation, um, again, that benchmark of 2100, mm-hmm. they actually have Michigan's climate shifting to the south and west so that we'll have something more similar to memphis tennessee okay so i don't know what kind of significantly warmer significantly wetter Mm -hmm. yep more humid they're like swamp Um, and then you know but then also potential for dry spells Mm -hmm. so you know southern agriculture Mm -hmm. things like cotton tobacco yeah um -hmm. you know warmer weather crops yeah. might be shifting to okay. Michigan in a hundred years. Oh, that's weird to think about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and when you really think about like how many miles that is and shifting for like, for our climate to just kind of climb down South is a little wild. If you yeah. ask me and, and very abruptly doing that, you know, a hundred years is a lifetime for us, but that's nothing, that's nothing. for mm-hmm. the earth. Yeah. <laughs> She's been around. <laughs> She's been around. <laughs> So we talked about uh, things coming down from the sky, and by things I mean water. Um, so what happens once it hits the ground? Yes. Where does the water go? So um, in a 100% natural system, which, mm-hmm. of course, that's few and far between now, mm-hmm. um, the bulk of it, more than 50% of it, would be absorbed by the ground. Mm-hmm. So that's infiltration. Okay. So infiltration, mm-hmm. you know, the, the water being absorbed into the ground, yeah. some of it's shallow, it like a sponge. Mm-hmm. some of it's deep. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how aquifers are recharged, store. Probably <laughs> mm. something. I like the new um, Amazon deliveries. They're, they're all electric and they're silent. You oh, can't hear it. Sh- Shut yeah. up, Amazon. I don't want to hear what you have to say anymore. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, All right, so yeah, the aquifers. So, yep, in, infiltration happens. Um, mm-hmm. The water's absorbed. the The deep absorption goes to to recharge the aquifers mm-hmm. to to stabilize groundwater. Basically, okay. is aquifer a synonym for groundwater? A- aquifer is a large collection of groundwater, almost like an underwater lake. Oh, or, excuse me, an underground lake. <gasps> underground lake. That's I've crazy. been to one. Yeah, they're huge. Do they hang out in like a cave they're in, formation or is it more like a sponge? Yep, they're, it, they can be in caves typically. So this is deep bedrock, you know, under layers and layers and layers of bedrock, maybe hundreds of feet underground. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the big one that has been, I think, kind of mainstreamed is the Ogallala Aquifer in the Great okay. Plains. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, when... The 20th century agricult- industrial agriculture complex took over the Great Plains. Mm-hmm. They were digging wells, thinking we have an endless supply of groundwater of to grow all mm-hmm. the crops we want to grow. Mm-hmm. And boom, that's where the, the first green revolution started in the, the middle of America mm-hmm. in like the 1920s and 30s. Okay. And by the end of the 20th century, we had almost completely drained the Ogallala. And Dang. so now today, there's, to stop. there's restrictions on how much water people can pump out of that aquifer. Okay. Dang. Okay. So there's some here in Michigan, too. Yeah. Um, our, ours aren't, Are they everywhere? Ours, um, t- it's hard to say what the specific distribution is. It's not regularly distributed. But they are kind of everywhere. But yeah. they don't have like a specific constrained geological range. I think it would probably just be based on the actual bedrock geology. Okay. So in Michigan, because of glaciation, you know, mm-hmm. we don't have a lot of shallow aquifers. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a few small pockets, really like mini aquifers, basically. Um, which is which is another issue that shallow infiltration that I was mm-hmm. talking about um, that can help recharge mm-hmm. groundwater um, and shallow aquifers. Okay. In the case of Ottawa County, Michigan, mm-hmm. 
over the last 20 years because of the rate of development that's been happening near like Holland and Hudsonville. Mm -hmm. They're actually draining (gasps) their aquifer. Really? And Michigan's unique geology, the aquifer that they've been pulling from has a calcium chloride cap from the old ocean that was here. Mm -hmm. And as they pull more water out, they're concentrating the salt in that water and actually salinizing the groundwater. So some farmers in Ottawa County are pumping salt water out of the ground to water their crops. What? This is what happens when you don't think about what you're doing before you do it. Or no, have foresight. Yeah, plain the foresight, and simple, dude. Right? Like it's the foresight. Just think about like the repercussions of your behavior. Yeah, it's mm. just as simple as that. And also, like, why do we f- like? You made a comment at the beginning of this conversation. We see water in such a strange way in this country. Why would you, because you see that there's water underground, feel like that's mine then? Yeah. When it came from a glacier. (laughs) I don't know. It's just bizarre to me. I actually had a question about that. You said we had very shallow aquifers because of glaciation. Uh, you can cut the salad out if you want to because I'm going to make a very gross comparison. The, The glaciers basically, as they were coming down, pop the aquifers like a pimple or is there a different reason about why they're in a different shape yeah no the 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 glaciers didn't have that level of impact on the bedrock geology it was mostly and again i'm yeah yeah yeah, they were more of a surface yeah exactly one of the reasons yeah i went to an underground lake it was in a cave and it was in uh, the Tennessee area, okay. mm-hmm. and you had to walk down a tube to get there. It was really cool. It sounds cool. Yeah, it was. I want to check one out. Um, but I just looked up a little fun fact here. MyHighPlains.com. This is just a simple Google search. Um, it says, how is it? Oh, how Ogallala. You, Ogallala. Um, it says that... Up to 40% of Ogallala will be unable to support irrigated crop production within the next 80 years. Other studies have even more dire news. Sorry, guys. Uh, Projecting that the entire aquifer will be 70% depleted in the next 50 years. So that is just like some of the stats that people have gathered around depletion of groundwater and how that impacts things like... Mm -hmm. And the aquifers, the the level of the aquifer is really important there because the 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 shallower it gets, the deeper people have to build their wells. Okay. So the longer they have to make their straws, which is expensive, mm-hmm. um, you know, could be cost prohibitive for a small yeah, family farm. Of yeah. course, they might go out of business. The big guy might come in and mm-hmm. have the resources to make. A, a deeper well yeah or have the reason to say these people need water we have to do this yeah and that will only further impact that exact aquifer correct yep okay um so is there a way to either regain more groundwater from our system or re like preserve it with the way that we live and the way that we pull water and things like that Potentially. And you can say, I don't know, Erica. I <laughs> the 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 little optimist that lives inside of me wants to say, Very Yeah, cool. sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just let it rain. Just, don't turn your sprinklers yeah, on. You but, know, is it is it less water use or um that's a, a little bit of a complicated question just because of where people where most people get their water from. Okay. Um and you know, most most people in the urban areas of West Michigan get their water from Lake Michigan directly, right. not mm-hmm. from groundwater. Mm-hmm. So we're good there so for that case. For, for the city dwellers. <clears throat> yes. For folks that live out in the, the rural areas or mm-hmm. the developing suburban areas where they rely on groundwater wells, mm-hmm. that's where it starts to become a little sketchy mm-hmm. as right. far as, you know, who who's able to afford healthy clean groundwater because as we know in places like northern kent county Mm -hmm. you can't drink the groundwater yeah healthy (laughs) yeah is not there clean is not not there there. yeah so um 
I would say the the best chance we have to preserve groundwater is better policy. Um, and that's a really boring and unsexy <laughs> answer, but yeah, right. it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we allow corporations like Nestle to pull an extreme amount of water. Out. Reminder for people that think that number is 1.1 million gallons of water per day for $200 a year. Yikes. What's your water bill? <laughs> yeah, more than per year. More than two hundred dollars in a year. Yeah. Do yeah. you also pump one point one million gallons of water? We a day? know. We know what you do with your water, Carlos. We've I, seen it. Dude, <laughs> it, it if, his <laughs> bath is running right now. No reason. <laughs> I can't even. Im- I can't even imagine how much time it would take a single household to use a million gallons mm-hmm. of water. Mm-hmm. I, have, I do, imagine like, a it's whole years. Whole pool party, like five times a day or something. Right? I imagine it's years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I imagine it's years. So regulating places like over overtakers, I guess, <laughs> regulating the corporations that have access to these things mm-hmm. would help support that. Is it because the amount of water they use and that's changing our climate? Is it because of the amount of water that that potentially takes from ground? Like, I, I don't really understand that. Portion. So the yeah, so the issue is they're taking it out faster than it can be naturally recharged. Right. Just like with fossil fuels, etc. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, that's that's a great analogy, you know, mm-hmm. um aquifers, groundwater, there's well, it will in the long term be recharged to 100% eventually. Mm-hmm. If we're taking 105% out of it every year, mm-hmm. It's never gonna. It's never gonna fill back up. Yeah. yeah. Um, not for us to use. Not for us to use. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, groundwater withdrawal is a huge issue. It's mm-hmm. one of those things that most policy um, doesn't regulate strict and strictly enough. Strictly enough, mm-hmm. I think is the yeah. Okay. Um, and it, groundwater has been um, in in. Folks in the water resources world Mm -hmm. in the Great Lakes area um, have started to refer to it as the sixth Great Lake because we do have about the equivalent of an entire Great Lakes worth of groundwater Mm -hmm. in Michigan. Okay. Spread out throughout both of our peninsula. But um, no. So it's almost like the invisible. Some party wants to be like, don't listen to that. Yeah. But again, <laughs> if Nestle's hearing when, this, <laughs> when when we think about that watershed concept, yeah, that groundwater is really still connected to the surface water. This mm-hmm. the surf the groundwater is how most of our streams and lakes are recharged with yeah. water. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we're depleting it at a million do- million gallons a day, yep. eventually it's going to start impacting our ability to have, it's just going to slowly deplete with all the other yeah. water. Again, that using the Colorado River as an example, the more that they're drawing out of that river, the drier it gets at the end. Okay. For us, it would be the more groundwater we're pulling out, the less water recharged in those rivers and streams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And I believe in, I, I think it's, maybe Everett, Michigan, mm-hmm. where the um, where the big Nestle, now now it's not even Nestle anymore, yeah. it's some other organization. Yeah. It's, Nestle, it's probably Nestle's cousin. It's, yeah, <laughs> I can't remember exactly what the transfer was, but... Um, it was Nestle's child, but yeah. They, uh, it's like, it has a very like environmental sounding name too, mm-hmm. so it sounds like... And they're greenwashing sounds, it. Yeah, it sounds like they're good, but they're also, and probably don't include any of this. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, oh, no, you're in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so just going back to the, the concept of pulling water out of the groundwater that would recharge a stream, mm-hmm. some of those streams are starting to dry up. Okay. And some of those streams are um, seasonal habitat for migratory fish mm-hmm. and birds and amphibians and reptiles yep. and us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they and, can't forget us. Yeah. And, and we're, we're losing streams. Mm-hmm. You know, we just in the state of Michigan since the 1800s, yeah. we've lost like 50% of our wetlands. Really? We're, 60%? Yeah. We're, I think I said 50, but oh, okay. um, over 50? it's, I think it's over 50% of yeah, wetlands. Have tomorrow been, it'll yeah. be 60. <laughs> um, 
and it'll be true of, next week you know with the with the latest supreme court ruling mm-hmm. we might continue to lose wetlands oh that's so um hard. and then <laughs> small intermittent or ephemeral streams mm-hmm. could be next okay and then the main streams and then rivers lakes that is gloomy <laughs> I will bring us back to the water cycle. And I know we've been talking kind of like with all the rabbit trails that could possibly exist. Okay, so we talked about precipitation. We talked about kind of infiltration and what that looks like in a natural environment, Um, which you said normally the soil would absorb that. It feeds into the watersheds, which feeds into streams, which feeds into lakes, which feeds into maybe another stream or river, which then feeds into maybe the ocean. The ocean, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's in a natural state. What happens in a built environment? Well, in the built environment, typically infiltration is very minimal. Um, oh. All of the hard surfaces, the buildings, the roads, parking lots, sidewalks. Concrete, asphalt? Concrete, asphalt? Asphalt. asphalt. I heard it pronounced yeah. asphalt. <laughs> um, that just sheds the water off. Mm-hmm. And that's why we have storm sewer systems. Okay. So, So instead of more than 50% being infiltrated into the soils, Mm -hmm. more than 50% is running off of the surface. Okay. But how is that bad? Because it's not running off into nowhere, right? Like it's running off into drains, which also go into the river. Yeah. But the bad thing is Uh all of those hard surfaces that I just named aren't just hard surfaces, right? They have all sorts of other things on top of them. I got a very lovely visual of just how oily and dirty and scrummy. Look at a parking are. lot. Look at a parking lot. Parking mm-hmm. lot. Okay. Next time you're at the gas station. Oh, the look gas at your feet. Station. Smell your shoes the next time you go get in your <laughs> <Yeah>. car <laughs> after uh, pumping gas. All of those That's things true. during a rainstorm. Yeah. Run off mm-hmm. into the storm sewer. I see now. And okay. the storm sewer, it does not filter does not clean the water Mm. some of them are designed there are there are things um, that we install that are designed to minimize the amount of debris so there's like settling basins so Mm -hmm. some of those things are captured yeah but the heavier the rain event the more is flowing directly into our streams and rivers okay and lakes can i ask why storm water isn't mixed in with water filtration if that helps um, it's a capacity issue. Right. They just like cannot filter yeah, that much yeah. water. Um, Nancy, you probably don't remember this. Maybe um, you do though, Erica. Prior to 2015, city of Grand Rapids and many of the other cities um, or metro area uh, municipalities had combined sewer overflows. Okay. The city of Detroit, city of Lansing, I think Kalamazoo, Mm -hmm. still have combined sewer overflows. And this is a system of essentially parallel pipes underground. Mm -hmm. You've got the storm sewer and you've got the sanitary sewer. And the sanitary sewer is coming from our toilets and sinks. Mm -hmm. And the storm sewer comes from our roads. Mm -hmm. And there's a little wall in between there, so they're not mixing it's like drywall wall. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a, it's cement, a pretty good size it's a wall. Okay. wall. Maybe it's two feet. Maybe it's six feet. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there are sections of that that are, you know, shorter than others, or maybe the connections a little bit smaller than others. Mm-hmm. And when we have these really big rain events, that storm water overflows oh. into the sanitary. And if enough flows into the sanitary, it backs up into the storm sewer and oh. so in uh, in the grand river for many many decades our our wastewater treatment plant would overflow during heavy rain events especially mm-hmm. in the spring mm-hmm. and untreated sewage would end up in the grand river and that goes straight into lake michigan and that goes straight into lake michigan those poor poor fish and that's where we get our drinking water Oh, no. <laughs> uh. Oh, and that's where uh, Nestle was getting water from. <laughs> Just so you know, you're taking shit water, Nestle. Um, no, but it is actually now One Rock Capital Partners. One Rock Capital, okay. Yes. Um, I'm yeah. going to be doing some research, so oh. the next episode I come 
much more correct. But uh, Nestle chose to sell our water to people that have no right to it. Mm-hmm. So either way, I still don't like them. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it Isn't was. Isn't there a count of days of how long it's been since Flint's had clean drinking water? Mm. Uh, well, I mean, it's 2014. Yeah, yeah. So that's. 2014 was. That's not, nine years. 2014 <laughs> was not a good year for water. Bad water year. Um, that was also the year that the city of Toledo had to turn their water system off because of toxic algae blooms in the Maumee River, where they draw their water from, which is exacerbated by nutrient loading from agricultural Mm -hmm. operations. And the western basin of Lake Erie is still one of those uh, priority sites for organizations or initiatives like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Mm -hmm. to try to reduce the amount of nutrients in there because we have these um, toxic algae blooms that Mm -hmm. literally make the water undrinkable. It kills wildlife. It could potentially kill humans. Mm. So it's just, it's crazy that all of these things, Flint, Toledo, I mean, I'm sure Detroit, Benton Harbor, Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, we're all Mm -hmm. (laughs) like in this kind of world of shit um, mm-hmm. literally and figuratively mm-hmm. in 2014. Yeah. yeah. 2014 was the last year um, before complete sewer separation in the city of Grand Rapids. So now we have what is techni- technically referred to as Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, or MS4. Okay. Um, and again, that's, that's a... It's my move, right? It's technical because it's a permit. So the city is allowed to discharge storm, storm water into the Grand River. Because, to prevent that. Because they, they change the way that they manage storm water. Okay. Mm-hmm. There are lots of other, like, very minutiae details about how, you know, how much storm water, what types of practices... That the city um, and its kind of neighbors, too, because the city of Walker, Wyoming, Kentwood, um, East Grand Rapids, others are part of this permit. Um, And, and, you know, we share this watershed together. So we got to figure out ways to manage the stormwater so that it's not continuing to degrade the water quality in the Grand River. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we need rain, right? Oh, yeah. We we want that. The stormwater is a good thing to have, but we can't have polluted stormwater because once it reaches a certain point, it has to go into the river. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, stormwater itself uh, and runoff kind of tying it back to the water cycle is another one of those forms of pollution. Mm-hmm. Um, again, because... Oh, that's so interesting that it counts as pollution, storm, but that makes sense. Stormwater carries all of that debris well, like and other chemicals. Salt, salt, somewhere, yeah. you know, pet waste. Oils. Um, yeah. Oils. Um, the fertilizers and pesticides that you uh, use on your yard. PFAS yeah. on your car PFAS from when you get a car wash. Your, yeah, all sorts, <laughs> yeah, all sorts of things. Oh. So... Um, uh, but but one of the big issues is how fast and how warm that water is. Mm. Well, the temperature when it's entering the streams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, why does that? Why does the temperature make a difference when it enters a stream? So streams uh, streams that are fed by groundwater are typically cooler or cold water streams. Mm-hmm. In the rain in the summertime when it rains and it hits a you know a blacktop parking lot oh, that's a hundred and fifty degrees. Mm-hmm it warms that water up. Mm -hmm. Boils the fish. And instead of infiltrating and cooling down naturally through the soils, Mm -hmm. it goes right into the pipes and right into the streams. It takes less than 15 minutes for a raindrop to get from the storm drain to the Grand River. Oh, that's fast. So in 15 minutes, the water's not cooling down fast enough. Not at all. And the just the immense volume of water that's moving through the storm mm-hmm. sewer system yeah. is causing the hydrology to just bounce all over. Yeah, because a lot of the currents and streams are partly they flow like with temperature too, right? Like yeah. different like levels of them in between. Um, I the the size of the stream typically. Um, has an effect on what the temperature of the stream is. Mm-hmm. So the sometimes the speed. <laughs> let me think about this here. <laughs> okay. Because uh, there's there's a big there's that fourth dimensional aspect to it because we have the time. the the time the phenology of the seasons right mm-hmm. so 
sometimes in in the winter obviously a melting snow isn't going to have a huge impact on the temperature of the stream mm -hmm. uh it might be maybe it's even colder than what the stream temperature is yeah in the summer when it's really really warm that's the bigger issue i think okay um because you're already reaching the top of which things can reach for temperature like of our capacity the range, yeah the range the tolerance range and yeah so if you're throwing it on to like you said a black top yep. asphalt is in its it, dripping downstream that's way too much heat for us to handle because we're already at max yep. in the summertime anyway okay. yep okay i'm just assuming that's what it is yeah mm -hmm. and temperature matters because um the temperature of the water dictates how much oxygen it can hold oh i didn't know that warmer water holds less oxygen yeah. less really? oxygen means less things can survive in that water mm -hmm. it's like when water is boiling yep. right same concept sure like the the water is the air escaping the water oh yeah yeah exactly i guess i'm trying to give it a visual sorry yeah exactly yep okay. so so think you know think of your little water molecules all bouncing around each other the mm -hmm. the warmer the water is the faster they bounce mm -hmm. so the less space there is between each one of them okay. to hold oxygen and oh. and other you know mm -hmm. dissolved gases mm -hmm. oxygen's the the most important one for yeah. aquatic wildlife though so okay yeah Good to know. um and I again like the the volume of water and that that flow alteration mm -hmm. um you know that can affect what is able to thrive in those water bodies as well okay. um i mean there are there are things as small as you know microscopic uh animals fungi um algae and and other plants that are going to be impacted by how much water is moving through that system mm -hmm. And they get washed out and you know, oh, have yeah. to like, it, it's like a spider having to, to uh, re-spin its web every night. You know, oh, like yeah. <laughs> you just have to go back in and, and have that whole community reestablish in that space. Mm -hmm. If there was a huge flood event, if there was a huge temperature event or chemical spill, mm -hmm. um, you know, things basically get wiped out and then have to reestablish and that takes time. And yeah. yeah. And, and with things like bacteria, the certain temperatures really do matter, right, in order for things to thrive. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, like, if something is too cold or too hot, it's just not happening at all. Yeah, the, these, the toxic algae blooms are actually a, a cyanobacteria, a mm -hmm. photosynthetic bacteria, um, and they thrive in warmer water. Mm. So the warmer that water is, the more blooms you'll see. Um, and, and that's something that we're already seeing in Michigan, um, okay. not just western basin of Lake Erie, but inland mm -hmm. lakes, the drowned river mouth lakes on the Lake Michigan okay. um, coast. Mm -hmm. So places like uh, Muskegon Lake, Lake Makatawa, White Lake, mm -hmm. Duck Lake, they're starting to see more toxic algae blooms happening, okay. not as big of a scale as Lake Erie. It. it as it's climate happening. changes, they're going to become more prevalent oh. even farther and farther north. Mm -hmm. Different times of year than they're typically expected. So it might overlap with beach season. It might overlap with boating season. I was just yeah. going to say that. So if you like your boats and your beaches and your beach houses, consider taking care of the climate because it's going to start impacting your summers in a way that's so much deeper than like, oh, it's just hot. It's like, no, you can't swim. Truth. <laughs> you, you can't drink <laughs> that water anymore. Yeah. You can't use it to grow food anymore. Yeah. You can't that's a big <laughs> right. let your, you can't fish from it. You can't duck hunt from it or, or whatever yeah. else you do with that water. Like it's just going to be inaccessible mm -hmm. and Back to my earlier point, the Great Lakes is 20% of the world's surface freshwater. Mm -hmm. So the, if world. We're, <laughs> the world. <laughs> like, really wrap <laughs> your brain say, around that. That there. if we F this one up, like. Yeah. Well, we and there are 8 billion of us. So and imagine us being any more than 20% oh, of We're at of 8 world. now? Oof. Yeah. Well, we, 7 to 8. We went okay. over no, 8 last time I checked. Oh, did we go over yeah. 6? Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. We, we went over 8 this we're year. We're in trouble, guys. I feel like. I feel like they're, predict <laughs> they're predicting nine faster than what we had previously thought. There we know. go. So imagine supplying billions of people yeah. water. Only about 40 million people live in the Great Lakes Basin currently. Mm -hmm. I'm about um, to put a fence around so, it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the 
kind of the the future of the Great Lakes Basin with climate change is there's going to be more people here because of course the low lying areas of the coast people are going to have to go inland. Yeah, drought stick drought stricken west communities are going to move to water rich areas Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're really the only one in north america unless you go north of the border uh that canada has a lot of lakes up there but that's canada (laughs) yeah no and canada is like you are not coming here (laughs) um and it as climate refugees immigrate to other places they're not going to pick coastal spaces they're going to pick places that are going to be safe havens and they're going to look directly toward michigan which is I mean, I love the idea of saving people who need help, but like we can only, we we don't even have capacity to house the amount of people in Grand Rapids that we need to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there, there's the concept of an ecological carrying capacity. So that's the amount of life that a, a ecosystem can support without collapsing. Right. Mm-hmm. 40 million people is a lot. Well, yeah. And we already have groundwater pollution mm-hmm. we already have yeah. surface water pollution we already have contamination of fishes wildlife where it's going to become more expensive to to get access to clean water right the, yeah the worse it becomes mm-hmm. the, the more we do yeah. the more we are in general yeah so, so I, I was just going to say as you like as you see your water bills going up it's not just because of inflation it's because pollution is more prevalent and they have to build new technology Mm -hmm. to keep it cleaner yeah and there's less they know that you were depleting it at a rate so you have to it's now valued differently than it was before yeah um so with all that being said what can we do to restore things either locally or on a larger scale i know you mentioned like we can regulate things differently which um is something that we would end up having to vote on more than anything i'm assuming but like what are things that we can do to make sure that um we are keeping either our backyards our streams our creeks our rivers at a place where we can continue to like address this issue yeah thank you nancy (laughs) not die (laughs) so um I'm trying to be nice I over here. <laughs> Cut this, but we're we're all gonna die. It's okay. Yeah. Well, well and, no, I'm gonna be real. We'll when you that. when you said 2100, I'm but, like, whew, I'm yeah. gonna be gone, gone. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, but extinction is really serious, right? Like yeah. it, this could be the existential crisis that that we face. And you know, could water be in will our life. be water will be climate has a huge role in in water resources. Yeah. Can I ask a personal question and don't feel pressure to answer? Oh sure. But as a parent, mm. how does that deadline feel to you? Or being aware of that twenty one hundred? Um I, I struggle with it a yeah. lot. Yeah. I struggle with it a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm a newer parent too. It's only been a little over two and a half years now. So, so your parent, your child's probably going to be reaching their old age right at that. Yeah, yeah. Eighty. If yeah, I mean, eight, mm-hmm. eighty is a nice, healthy age for mm-hmm. most people. Mm-hmm. Um, I would anticipate my children being able to survive till eighty. Yeah. So, but that's, I mean, and I'm not trying to gloom this out, but like that's eighty with healthy food, exactly. and air, yeah, yeah. and water, yeah. and resource, and and less stress, and, and things yeah. like that. This is a healthy eighty years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So imagining depleting something. Or, or taking it away, I don't think that we would be very healthy in 80 years. I, Sorry, not, not I didn't if, mean to not fuck things, that up for no, that's you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not if we don't change how we right. do things. Right, and that's that's the point I'm exactly, getting at. Exactly, yes. Yeah. If we're on this trajectory, I don't think my children would live to, to a healthy 80 years right? Um, without, you know, really extreme intervention or... Yeah. I don't know, us becoming billionaires so that we're yeah. the only ones that have access to fresh food and clean water. Paying for bottled <laughs> yeah. air. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so along those lines then, this is really important for us to have a discussion about, about how we can restore things, yeah. how we can make sure that we are not going to do something that will deplete out ourselves and future selves. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I probably won't be here by that year and I plan on remaining like a child free adult. So I don't have direct descendants to worry about. But I do worry about like non-direct descendants like everybody oh, yeah. else who is yeah. still a child or, 
you know, soon to come to yeah. the world. So. Um, I, I think the, the best place to start is your backyard. Okay. If you have a backyard, mm -hmm. your own home, wherever you dwell. Um, so being responsible with your water use, mm -hmm. you know, obviously that can help in a lot of ways. Um, if you, if you have space, a yard, uh, even if you rent and, you know, speak to your, to your property owner, land, landlord or whatever of, mm -hmm. can we plant more native plants? Mm -hmm. Uh, grass lawns suck. Big thumbs down. <laughs> they, they are a huge contributor to climate change and I will speak against the grass lawns all day long if Me I could. Me too. <laughs> I despise them. I think they should be illegal. Um, I think you should get fined for having the fact that they were literally like just that. a status symbol from the French aristocracy. Like, how yeah. did we... It's not even American. Nope. You're um, not a golf course and even if you are, <laughs> there's clover. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, keep going. That, no, that's fine. Um, start in your backyard. Start in your backyard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, con convert portions of your lawn. I if you use your lawn recreationally, that's fine. But there are really, there are better ways to manage your own space. Mm -hmm. um, I'm killing my lawn. Going going back to the water cycle, mm -hmm. you know, think about each individual plant in its role in the water cycle. Mm -hmm. The more trees we take out, the more natural prairies and wetlands and meadows that we remove, mm -hmm. the less that water cycle is acting in its normal path. Mm -hmm. And so grass lawns have very, very shallow root systems. They don't use a lot of water yeah. naturally. It's just like three inches if that, yeah. right? And, and that's one of the reasons that people have to water their lawn so much is because those roots don't go deep enough to mm. get access to the groundwater. They're just surface level. They're just surface level. Yeah. Na <laughs> native, <lame>. wi <laughs> native wildflowers, <laughs> grasses, trees, their root systems go tens of feet really? down to the ground. So they help retain it because they're reaching. They're that reaching far. down. They're okay. bring you know, and that's carbon sequestration too, mm -hmm. because all of those roots are made from carbon. That's cellulose, right? So they Ay. lock up carbon, bury it way down in the ground. Mm -hmm. And then they pull that deep storage water. Which also means you don't really have to water it because they're just tapping into exactly. a natural water source. Exactly. It's, so like, it's, it's like a terrarium. It's water conservation. <laughs> well, that it is. It's climate mitigation, mm -hmm. all just from some pretty flowers. Yeah. And don't the roots also help to prevent erosion too they from like stormwater it. runoff? They prevent erosion. They mm -hmm. provide habitat. They build healthy soil microbiome. They bring a smile <laughs> to your face. <laughs> I see you like yeah, lighting yeah. up as you talk oh, about this. For uh, our listeners, yeah. Carlos is <laughs> grinning passionately as he's describing oh. flowers. This so. has been a hard conversation, so let's uh, talk about yeah. the flowers. Yeah, no. <sighs> Plants are the, like I said, they're the contra lung, right? They're they're the mm -hmm. unsung heroes of climate adaptation and resilience. I would go as far as to call them counter humans. They, <laughs> they, I mean, plant, so far, plants in in many ways are the reason that we have animals, right? Yeah, the, the whole absolutely. evolutionary process of of animals is because of plants mm -hmm. and vice versa, mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> most of the animals we eat only eat plants. Correct. So. Yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah. um, so start in your backyard, mm -hmm. grow some plants, let the flowers grow. If you have a grass lawn, let it grow. Like, mm -hmm. let it grow long. You don't have to yeah. cut it every week. Th that's carbon sequestration, too, yeah. you know? Um, no mo May has become... No mo May. I did that shit, so it came up to become, my calves. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I love it. And that, in a dry year, it'll yeah. even grow up to your calves, And right? that I was just going to make that comment. Look around at, like, the bleached grass look we have going on, like... If doesn't that doesn't good. scream unnatural, <laughs> and then good. you look at your neighbor's lawn who does have a natural lawn, and they're yeah. like doing all right, it's like, yeah, I have some um, native plants kind of along the edge of my garden, and like even though my grass is all yellow and dead, the plants are like thriving. Yeah. They're so happy. They're good. And those the mm -hmm. coreopsis right now mm -hmm. are popping, mm -hmm. and the bees love it. Yes, Pop and the poppin'. and the butterflies are coming. Mm -hmm. um, milkweeds on its way to being in bloom so we'll, we'll start to see things like monarch butterflies and all those other great things mm -hmm. it's all just water <laughs> <laughs> so it's so water. really what i'm hearing too is not only like 
making sure that you're having more plant and wildlife, but like allowing for it to restore itself yeah. by doing that. Definitely. So like bring the right things to the right places and then just let them do their thing. Let it go. You yeah. can assist them if necessary, but otherwise like the rain is going to do it. Yeah. The roots are going to reach the point where you, the rain doesn't even matter anymore yep. and it just continues to give. Yeah. Um, you, you know, there are, there are definitely things that you can do to mimic some of the natural processes that don't happen anymore, like okay. um, large herbivore uh, grazing. Mm. You know, we don't we don't have herds and herds of elk and bison and deer roaming through our streets uh, yeah. of Grand Rapids. Not recently. Which is not recently. I mean, <laughs> deer, yes, but uh, elk and bison, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they would have come through mm-hmm. all of these mixed you know grasslands savannas prairies okay. and they would have cut down the native grasses and wildflowers mm. that by incurred, eating them by and eating stepping them, on them stepping okay them. they're distributing seeds and pollen nice. and providing other you know functions of this ecosystem mm. that don't happen anymore so if you've got a native plant garden every once in a while you got to chop it down yeah chop it down it, or walk through it walk or through it. yeah walk through it you know um disturb it a little bit and yeah. that disturbance helps to spark regrowth okay and shake and, them up a little and that helps to build the soil even further okay. and get those plants established even more mm-hmm. and Good again that's more carbon sequestration yeah. more water storage more ha- more habitat more wildlife coming back yeah. I, and i was just going to say that i'm so glad that you just said more wildlife coming back because as we allow for wildlife to continue continue to grow we welcome back some of the animals that would have potentially done that like more deer would come back to these spaces if they had a place to graze through and if we treated them better and we treated our spaces better um if they had natural plants to eat but the fact that we all have grass and they're like well there's no food here for me you know and then obviously cars and in danger and other things add to that but um, okay, so native plants. Yeah, which a lot of people now, like when they plant a bunch of them together, they kind of refer to them as rain gardens even, right? Because of how they filter and process mm-hmm. rain the water. Yeah, yep. Uh, rain, rain gardens are a really great um, practice to have. Um, if, if your soils, if your yard is able to, to have one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, certain soils will drain water faster than others. Okay. If you have a lot of clay, rain gardens typically aren't great right okay. it's not going to yeah, penetrate through yeah, the clay exactly okay yeah. mm-hmm. if it's you know sandier soils that mm-hmm. water drains really quickly you have to plant certain types of plants to keep you know to keep healthy mm-hmm. in that type of um soil as well but yeah yes rain, rain gardens are great um you know they can help mitigate localized flooding mm-hmm. um f- places like parking lots that get flooded you can add a little you know, curb cut rain garden Mm -hmm. and all of that flood water will go into the rain garden and and create a new habitat. Mm -hmm. And that pesky flood water is off of your parking lot yeah, or your yard or your roof or, you know, out of your basement or Mm -hmm. something like that. Were you guys involved in the one that we, we, who was it? Uh, yesterday we went to go meet with Pastor Lori from East Church. And one of the things that she showed us is like the rain garden that they just installed, I think within the last two years in their parking lot. It, all it's of really their nice. rain drains into the corner. There's a drain right at the corner of it. But then there's like probably what a five by five or ten by ten like space yeah. that is all filled with native plants. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, it acts like a little basin to catch yeah. all that water. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is the cool. I'm sorry. It was I was like kind of. The idea, the concept of it is so cool. I mean, I just imagine like, you know, where you have driveways that go down. Like Mm. if you just had something that supported that in any way, like you could still put a drain over it, but like to have something underneath growing or something like that, um, it would just be so much more effective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So rain gardens are one of many practices um, that are referred to as green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So rain gardens are, you know, they're typically a basin. They're below grade, below the level of the, you know, typical ground. Mm -hmm. Um, They they collect, store temporarily, and help infiltrate that water. So, again, Mm -hmm. reconnecting that water cycle that we've disconnected. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, trees are another form of green infrastructure. They can also be, you know, 
tree wells, as they're referred to in the mm. engineering world, um, mm. they can be designed to to function like a rain garden essentially. But oh, interesting. you know, trees trees use a lot of water. Mm-hmm. Um, a mature like thirty year old tree can just on its leaves hold over a hundred gallons of water during a rain event. Whoa! So that's that's, that's like interception. Slowing it down, letting right. it drip. It trickles down, it trickles down. Slow, like the yep. next day after a storm. Oh, you when mean the like wind outside blows. the leaves, not even in the leaves. On on the surface of the leaves. Oh, it's yeah. one of my favorite Bananas. things. Is the day after a storm when the wind blows and you feel the water moving on after. I think that's just so cool. So yeah. hundred gallons. Hun- a, a mature a, a mature tree. Yeah. Think about how many you know thirst if, if quenched. An av- if an average leaf <laughs> is about the size yeah. of your hand, there's thousands of leaves on a tree. Yeah, and just a thin surface of water times all of those leaves, mm-hmm. gallons and gallons and gallons. So a reason why having urban canopies would also be helpful. They're going to hold water in different ways, yep. but then also going to help the soil underneath so that the groundwater is staying retained as well. Yep. Okay, very cool. Okay, so that's green infrastructure. But what green about infrastructure. So, other infrastructure? Yeah, so um, some of it is less visibly green, mm-hmm. but the green refers more to the the kind of Living the, the natural the natural function mm-hmm. of the infrastructure. Okay. okay. So that's where the the engineering infrastructure term comes from. Some of them are still engineered design constructed mm-hmm. um, practices yeah but they're not vegetated okay um so what are some examples of that uh permeable pavement is one of the newest technologies that most cities are incorporating into their storm water oh, management that's plans cool. mm-hmm. so you might see these um in parking areas bike lanes uh parking lots mm-hmm. you know the street level parking, yeah. um, sidewalks even. Um, the tree wells are also designed. Um, if you've ever noticed a street tree in a downtown area that has kind of like this rubberized area yeah. around it, mm-hmm. um, those are permeable. Those are They have oh. little tiny holes that the mm-hmm. rainwater can soak into. Mm-hmm. And underneath there might be some sort of subsurface water storage. Okay. Helps to water the tree, helps to keep the water out of those storm sewers. Mm-hmm. You are blowing <laughs> helps my mind. To, yeah, <laughs> helps to infiltrate. So Th- There's reservoirs there, holding this water. There could be, yeah. There could be. That makes so much sense. Some of them could even be built tens of feet right. out and under the, the sidewalk. So you could be walking on water storage and not even know it. Okay. You could park your car. Um, there's actually... I think the downtown market has these almost like cavern. You could probably walk through them. They're so large. They're these little underground vaults that can store water for a period of time after a rainstorm. And below that, there's, you know, particular types of substrate that help to infiltrate water. So over top of a a hard surface, Mm -hmm. they have drains in the parking lot. Those drains lead to these underground vaults that can store thousands if not millions of gallons of water during a rain event and that stops the over uh, the surface the su- runoff, surface runoff. Yeah. okay yeah. Yeah. wow so but those are like architectural details because i guess a lot of it is like invisible to the like a normal person like a lay person yeah right, right. yeah but yeah like, the, these it's, are it's under that, a parking lot or under yeah. a, a yeah. parking but space people weren't thinking like that when they were building buildings even i don't know how say would you this how new is this? Is it like 20 years, 50 years? Like when did we finally start thinking about water um, when we're constructing new things? Um, I'm sure the invention of some of these is probably as old as 50 years. Mm-hmm. But as far as like common practice, that's in the last 10 to 15. Oh, okay, so yeah. fairly recent. Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, with these um, stormwater pr- discharge permits, mm-hmm. they're, they're being required now. Right. The okay. city of Grand Rapids, for instance, has a stormwater management requirement for any new development that's going to increase the amount of impervious surfaces or hard surfaces on a property. Mm-hmm. They're required to capture a certain volume of stormwater on site. Okay. It was a solution to the flooding problem or a, por- a portion a portion of solving the flooding problem that you had. 
Yeah. So that's why it has to have that at this point. It's yeah. like it not only does it help, but like it prevents us from having the same issues that we were having before. The, yeah. The flooding, all the other pollution and surface runoff that would come from the building or the parking lot that they're that they're constructing. But now they're saying all of this water that falls on your property has to stay on your property for as long as possible. Hopefully it will be infiltrated into the ground. Yeah, right. And not enter the storm sewer so that it doesn't go directly into the rivers and streams. So one way that we could, as a city, then continue to make sure that you do, that water is utilized is to make sure that we have plants that are going to soak up that water as much as possible. Yeah. So yeah. that they are dispersed properly and not just thrown back into our sewer systems or evaporate or whatever. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, that's so cool. Um. So wetlands are going to be another one? Yeah, wetland wetland restoration like I mentioned earlier, we've lost a significant amount of wetlands in our country and our state. Um is it over 50%? Over 50%. <gasps> most of the Detroit metro area was wetlands historically. Oh, really? Wow. So, you know, if you think about its geography Detroit. and position <laughs> um of, you know, it drains from Lake Huron. There's the uh, let's see St. Mary's Isn't that kind River, of a bad idea St. to Clair build the whole Mary's. city and in then, a wetland. Yeah, you think? <laughs> um, so you know, so the, <laughs> Mexico City. <laughs> the, the definition of a wetland, right, is a play as a low lying, typically a low lying area uh-huh. where water will collect and stand for a long period of time. Yeah. So if you plow over that, build highways, build buildings, where does that water? want to be that same exact spot wants to be right where it is so you can imagine fast forward to 2021 i think it was Mm -hmm. a really really rainy spring after a really really snowy winter Mm -hmm. you have lots of localized flooding in the lowest lying areas Mm -hmm. and in cities like detroit they typically will dig out land to build uh, highways mm-hmm. and i don't remember if you <laughs> if you saw the Did or i don't know if you <laughs> study physics Dude, yeah. detroit has just do. been they're, like they're i'm engin- gonna do whatever the f- they're engineers <laughs> they they come up with all these really great um solutions to the inconvenience of nature um but often don't consider the a natural solution nature. to the inconvenience of man right <laughs> <laughs> Um, so again, this well, is we're what, not one of nature. This That's is why we're coming back with this green infrastructure stuff. So um, back in in that, I think it was 2021, the flooding, the really bad flooding in Detroit. Most of the highways were the areas that were flooded because mm-hmm. they had been dug out. They're oh. below mm-hmm. most of the the neighborhood grade level surface mm-hmm. surface level, yeah. um, and those historically were wetland areas. So that water doesn't want to move. Yeah. And it collects in those low-lying areas. And I remember seeing pictures of people swimming. <gasps> Kayaks out the there. The highway, <laughs> the flooded highway, swimming, kayaking, mm-hmm. whatever. Dang. And Detroit, as I said earlier, still has a combined sewer overflow system. So all of those flooded areas likely had untreated sewage. Yeah. And people were swimming. And fishing, and yeah. Family. I mean, you know, but time. also just living surprised. near, and just just, living just there. being around it in general yeah. is just not healthy. Not healthy at all. Um, and so things like preserving wetlands, things like not building over them, things like making conservations the top of our list, and then also making sure that we're preserving the land that we have potential to, like yeah. our backyards, like our, our parents' backyard. Go to your parents' backyard <laughs> and make sure their creek is looking on point <laughs> or whatever you can do. Yeah. Um, because there is things like 30 by 30, which is trying to preserve um, at least 30% of all land, right? So by 2030. Mm. So we're trying to um, make sure that every state is up to that code. Michigan, I believe is closer to 19 percent um so things like advocating for not building over wetlands and not allowing for people to overdevelop our spaces are gonna not only contribute to our climate issue but also keep us on track for the goals that we have in our future um but what would be your call to action for people who are listening something that is maybe um, a little bit more easy 
to figure in a life where you're either not already openly fighting toward change or the climate issue that we're facing or you're just like a super busy parent right or you <laughs> could have like an easy mode call to yeah. action like yeah. a expert mode call to no action. well then nancy will come in and be like and then what you need to do <laughs> is murder your entire lawn <laughs> do your neighbors as well <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the light version and then sure. we can come in with something sure. a little bit heavier too all right i, I think the the easiest easy answer vote Okay. Oof. That's mm-hmm. a good one. I mean, vote. One. The so, majority of us can do it. Because in 2016, mm-hmm. we had a presidential election that mm-hmm. resulted in three nominees mm-hmm. to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court just rolled back wetlands protections. Yep. And if the other candidate would have won, we would have had a completely different Supreme Court, and none of that would have happened. Maybe more protected wetlands. More protected wetlands. Yeah, right. So vote. Okay. So that's the easy level. <laughs> vote. That's the easy like level. really actually think yep. about who you're about to put into our, what we have primaries coming up pretty mm-hmm. soon here. Yeah. So I really like that answer. Yeah. Um, well, it's hard mode. Well, can I give an easy mode or an easier mode? Sure. Medium well, mode? it might not be easier. Um, but as mode. you were mentioning uh, rainwater and just how valuable it is. Um, I know that Wemiak has a link on their website right now um, where they talk about rain barrels. That that was going to be my next level, how you can participate in water conservation. Oh. Uh, rain, rain barrels are another kind of entry level green infrastructure, yeah. right? Green, again, the, the green part of the green infrastructure is thinking uh, as a nature-based solution. Mm-hmm. So rain barrels hold hold the water, slow it down, and allow it to trickle mm-hmm. and infiltrate nat- more naturally. Yeah. Um, rain gardens, same thing. Mm-hmm. It, if you are a property owner, a business owner, consider converting your parking lots. Consider, uh, you know... It, it, it's an expensive practice, but things like green roofs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and if anybody has any questions about these things, feel free to contact us at Wemiac. Um, you can drop into our open office hours. We have a zero storm water runoff site. Really? Ooh. That's kind of cool. 1007 Lake Drive. They're um, walking the walk. We have, <laughs> we've got a green roof. We've got a rain garden. Very cool. We have all sorts of other really cool things. We've got a, a double gold lead certified building. <gasps> so we, we've got a, a lot of cool on-site demonstration um, mm-hmm. things. So okay. learn, learn, I guess, is the... Is Can we take a tour? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Like I said, we've got we've got open office hours Monday through Thursday right now. So mm-hmm. Very cool. come on by and somebody'll show you the cool things that we've got. Okay. And and on the rainwater topic, now that I'm thinking about it, um, in my apartment, what I will do the next time it rains is I'll put a mason jar outside <laughs> and I'm gonna use that to water my plants instead of getting water from my go. sink. Yeah. My plants will appreciate it a whole lot more and I will use a tiny bit less water, which yeah. will contribute in one way or another if I do it fifty times. If you've got, <laughs> if you've got like a, a funnel that's wider than the that surface, surface area, area, just boom, just put that on your uh mason and jar and you'll collect yes. that much little bit more water wow. maybe you'll double it i don't know let's triple well, it can I <laughs> triple. Do the hardcore yes call all right yeah. now everybody hang on to your seats nancy's gonna <laughs> i know here she comes storm of nancy <laughs> <laughs> i feel like it's one that i've said before but rip up your lawn <laughs> throw it away <laughs> i told you she was gonna say stab your lawn and your neighbors <laughs> um or if you don't want to rip it up because that is a lot of work you just cover it with a layer of i think they call it contractor's paper which is a uh, not plastic that you can just use and then throw like a couple inches of mulch over it and before you know it you'll have no lawn Word. and you'll be happier for it yeah we, um, we just reduced our lawn by doing just that. We, we actually used non-dyed, non-painted um, yeah, cardboard. Yeah, like craft brown. Okay, yeah. We used cardboard. Yep. So that'll, that'll smother out just about anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you, yeah, amend soil on top with composted mulch, yep. you got a perfect little starter garden bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even if you don't want to do anything with that, you just don't have an invasive plant stealing water from the ground which is just going to continue to contribute toward what we're talking about right now Mm -hmm. yeah 
Cool. One of, oh, and also like if you're not a homeowner, um, one of my friends, her name's Rachel Barecki. She actually went to her First employers. Um, she went to her employers and was like, "Hey, like it kind of sucks that we just have this like non-beneficial landscape in front, like on our property. Can I do something with it?" And they were like, "Yeah, do whatever you want. We don't care." So she was able to plant like a whole native garden that got her job. Awesome. So that's awesome. another small yeah. thing that you guys can probably do. Talk to your people about making effective changes mm-hmm. in your yeah. lawns and with water storage. Yep. We love it. Thank you so much. This has been Thanks, Carlos, for so informative. <laughs> Thanks. Mm-hmm. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Mm-hmm. This is all the years of you storing information <laughs> into one moment. And we're all excited. Yeah, the knowledge <laughs> yeah so. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Um, so thank you for listening to Green Rapids. Peace. 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 Peace.